Okay. Good evening. I want to take just a moment to welcome each of you to uh, Peak of the Week and then also those of you who are joining us on Facebook. We're glad you're here as well. Uh, last week we had questions and answers and we dealt with that, I think, uh, at least halfway adequately. But uh, this week we're going to push on. We're going to actually get into a book again. That's what we like to do, especially on Peak of the Week, verse by verse. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, we're, uh, we're covering in breakneck speed the New Testament, uh, slowly and surely. Now, there's a couple of books that I've dodged my entire preaching career. And uh, I, I've not done it on purpose, but it just sort of has never worked out that way. But uh, as we continue to cover the New Testament books, we're going to hit them all. Uh, Romans is hard. First and Second Corinthians is extremely difficult. And I have managed to use those books in my preaching over and over again and many, many passages from those books, but never a verse by verse through those books. So we're going to get there. But tonight, we're actually going to study, begin a study in First Thessalonians, and then we'll also go to Second Thessalonians, because this is a church that uh, needed some instruction. They had some mistaken ideas about the second coming of Christ and some other things, and, and that happens. And so it would be good for us to uh, deal with uh, these books and each church being unique in its personality, in its goodness, and also in its mistakes. Uh, it becomes necessary because we can dodge the mistakes that they made and yet uh, reenact and enable the things that they did good and, of course, uh, Paul deals with that church at Thessalonica in a very thorough way. So that's where we're going to be this evening. But before we get into the book and get into some background material regarding the book, uh, are there any prayer requests? Anything that's not in our, uh, in our bulletin under prayer request? Okay. All right. Um, keep Teresa in your prayers. Her mother got stranded by Frontier Airlines in Orlando. She had to leave last night at 6.30 to go there and pick up her mom and stay with her till tomorrow. Her mother's 86 and it was a big confusion and anyway, she's fine, but a lot of driving involved and, and so keep her in your prayers. Um, also continue to remember uh, the church here as we emerge from this pandemic and start making headway into service again and doing those things that God has called us to do that will have wisdom in the, in the execution of those things. Help us, uh, the good Lord, to help us in our direction. All right, let me ask you if you would to bow with me and let's go to God in prayer. Father, we bow before you and we're thankful for the privilege of coming to this place and being able to study the word that you gave the church of the first century we know father that word is ours as well and it will lead us and guide us it will lighten our way it will help us as we struggle with life and sometimes father as we struggle with faith be with us as we study open our hearts open our minds fathers help us to do those things that you have caused to be written help us to do what's right and, Father, help us to have the strength to continue all the days of our life. We pray, Father, for those who are on our sick list, that you'll be with them, that you'll comfort them, heal them if it's within the boundaries of your will. Be with this church as we emerge from this pandemic and restart. Father, help us to know which way to go, what to do, how to reach those that we can reach, that we might bring many souls to you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the cross. Help us, Lord, as we live this life that we might always live in its shadow. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter is where we're going to be. But before we start reading, let's get a little bit of background information. Pretty much there's a consensus that the Apostle Paul wrote this book. It's pretty obvious in the very first 
uh, verse of the book, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul identifies himself right off the bat and also makes note of the fact that Silvanus and Timothy are actually with him. The book was probably written somewhere around 53 A.D. So keep in mind, that's what, 23 years Within 23 years after the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, Paul is writing a Gentile church in Thessalonica and giving them instructions as to how to live the Christian life and what their lives are to be about. First and second Thessalonians was written by Paul during his second missionary journey. Uh, the theme in both first but especially second is the second coming of Christ. Now, that's important because this church is only, what, 23 years away from the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And yet they're anticipating and actually expecting the second coming of Christ within their lifetime. Now, here we are 2,000 years past the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And most people today don't think it's really ever going to happen. They just sort of think, well, I'm not sure... It's sort of like what Peter says. Everything continues the same since the fathers fell asleep. It's just going to keep on going. Well, trust me, one day Christ will come again. I'm not sure when, but I know he will. And I know one thing for certain. I'm just a simple boy from Georgia, but I know we're closer now than they were then. <laughs> I can figure that much out. But it was written by Paul uh, when he stayed at Corinth uh, for a year and a half. He actually stayed at Corinth for a year and a half. Uh, both books, uh, one out of every eight verses in 1 Thessalonians and three out of every eight verses in 2 Thessalonians have to do with the second coming of Jesus. So this theme is present in both. Not as much in the first one, but definitely in the second one. Now let me give you a timeline here just a little bit because it helps you sort of relate. Keep in mind the one history book that we have within the pages of the New Testament is the book of Acts. And that's the history of the church from the day of Pentecost on until Paul's imprisoned in Rome for two years. So let me give you a little bit of a timeline. Paul and Silas are imprisoned and beat at Philippi in Acts the 16th chapter 19 through 40. Paul, Silas, and Timothy leave Philippi and go to Thessalonia, Acts 17 and verse 1. Paul preaches in Thessalonia, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2. And then they labored early and late. They actually, Paul was a tent maker. So instead of burdening this young church, he would actually make tents and labor on the side to support himself while he was in Thessalonica. Paul preached for three Sabbath days there. Acts the 17th chapter verses 1 through 3 and according to Acts 17 and verse 4, some of the Jews actually believed there. But a great multitude of Greeks and chief women believed according to Acts the 17th chapter and verse 4. So your, your population of this church is primarily Gentiles or Greeks. But there are also uh, some uh, Jews who also believe according to Acts 17 and verse 4. Paul remained in Thessalonica about probably about three weeks possibly three to four months up to three to four months uh, some people actually venture to say he may have stayed there seven or eight months there, there's no way to really tell that uh, I, I some people do speculation they read external works from uh, church fathers and so forth and come up with some things but you got to be careful there uh, you know you can speculate that's fine how long Paul stayed in Thessalonica but it's really not important the fact is he was there unlike the church at Colossae he had actually met these individuals and had a part in a number of their uh, conversions Paul lodged at the home of Jason while he was in Thessalonica, Acts 17, verses 5 through 7. Actually, it might be a good idea tonight when you go home to read Acts 17, and they're going to see some of the things that we're talking about right now as far as background information. The Jews eventually stirred up a riot. Those Jews that did not come to Christ and were not a part of the church at Thessalonica, they stirred up a riot against Paul in Acts 17, verses 5 through 9. And the Jews apprehended Jason, but Paul was able to escape. 
Now, I'm glad of that because there's no telling what they'd have done. Paul and Silas actually fled by night to Berea. And that's where you get the verse, the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica, for they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things that Paul and Silas were saying were true. That's important. That's important because the Bereans are lifted up because of their diligence in searching the scripture. And they're even, they're even fact-checking Paul when it comes to what he's preaching. And the great apostle Paul is being fact-checked and they're commended for that. They're actually commended for it. Paul attempts twice to return to Thessalonica, but was actually hindered and unable to do so. He sends Timothy back to Thessalonica from Athens to check on the church. One thing that we need to realize about Paul being an apostle to the Gentiles, you know, which, which is sort of funny because uh, Peter was more like the apostle to the Jews, uh, but he brought the Gentiles in, Acts the 10th chapter. But then when Paul was actually converted... In Acts, the ninth chapter, three years, he went down to Arabia. I'm convinced he received revelation from the Lord there. Uh, For those three years, he was in Arabia. But when he came back, God made him the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, here's this up-and-coming Jewish star on the Jewish theological horizon. And God says, nope, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. So it's sort of like, but listen, he couldn't have sent anyone better to the Gentiles. Because Paul loved those churches. And he was constantly checking up on those churches. You know, I, I, I look at this and I go, wow, you know, it must be something. Because I can be in one place, one church. Every church I've been in, that, that's been my focus. I can't imagine what it would be like to try to focus on 12 or 15 or 30 you know, spread across an entire continent. I can't imagine what it must have been like for Paul to try to focus on all the churches that he was concerned about. But he sent Timothy back to Thessalonia from Athens to check on the church. And after sending Timothy back, he left Athens for Corinth. That's Acts 18 and verse 1. Now, Timothy, I said Timmy, I didn't mean to say that. That just sort of came out there. Let's not call Timmy, Timothy, Timmy, all right? (laughs) Timothy hooked up with Silas and found Paul in Corinth and brought him the news of the Thessalonian Christians. Now, he brought with him good news and bad news. You know, you ever have someone tell you, I got good news and I got bad news. Which one do you always want first? You want the bad first? Yeah, I usually say, all right, tell me the bad, and then I'll be excited about the good, right? Well, I'm going to give you the pros first. Their faith and love was great, and they were spreading the word. Now, the cons. Some were still actually immoral. Some Christians there were still living in moral lifestyles. Some were idle. They had quit their jobs thinking that Jesus was going to come real soon. And so they just wanted to hang out until Jesus came again and they had stopped working. Some misunderstood. Actually, it appears that a number of the Thessalonians misunderstood the second coming of Christ and the correlation to the dead. All right, and and we're going to get to that. It's a little more complicated than just that little subtitle. And some actually falsely accused Paul of using flattery and mercenary motives and even accused him of impurity. And Paul's going to make a defense of that when we get to it. But the book addresses all of these, the pros and the cons. And it's, I think, probably two of the most wonderful books in the Bible when it comes to reassuring us and building up our faith that Jesus is going to come again. Listen, we need to understand something. And, and I, know it's, I know it's difficult because it's been 2,000 years. And, and so sometimes we sit there and go, eh, it's been 2,000 years and he's not come yet. And oh, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe we're all misunderstanding this thing, you know. But, but here's the thing. The first coming of Christ The number of prophecies pointing to the first coming of Christ is one-eighth of how many prophecies point to the second coming of Christ. All right? And, of course, we got the New Testament that's constantly pointing to that. But in the Old Testament, every so many verses talked about the first coming. Some actually even talked about the second coming. I mean, Daniel actually says that uh, shut up the words and seal up the book until the end. 
Many shall run to and fro in earth, and knowledge shall be increased, which might be a hint to today's society. Uh, many will sleep in the dust of the earth. Those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting shame and contempt. So that prophecy is actually pointing to the second coming of Christ. So you have prophecies in the Old Testament that point to the messianic arrival of the Messiah. You know, Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, 30 pieces of silver, my hands and my fear, feet, they've pierced my hands and my feet. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They cast lots for his vesture. All of those are pointing to the first coming of Christ, but there are many that point to the second coming of Christ where he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. So we need to get that. But listen, for us in the 21st century, we need to understand something. God doesn't lie. And the first coming ended in pain and suffering the likes of which you and I will never understand. We will never get the crucifixion. Even if we were crucified ourselves, we will never get what Christ went through on that cross because he went through more than just physical death. He took upon himself the sins of all of mankind. He became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we have no idea what that's like. We have no idea. I don't know about you, but it's hard enough and heavy enough just to bear the ones I got, right? I, wouldn't Im I can't imagine what it would be like to bear the guilt for the sins of the entire world. So that first coming ended in pain and suffering, the likes of which you and I will never understand. It was His first coming was in humility. Very few people knew about it. It was uh, sort of secluded from a world point of view in this little bitty country in this world dominated by Rome it's in this teeny weeny little country and you've seen the card he never traveled more than a hundred miles from his home he never commanded an army he never went to school all that stuff so it's very obscure his first coming it was in poverty and and really if you want to say it was in weakness in that you know he he didn't come in power like he will come the second time my point is this if God in order to fulfill his word made sure that Christ came and went through all that he had to go through, all that suffering, anguish, and, and obscurity, and, and poverty. Can you imagine God not allowing Christ to come the second time to be glorified and in power and in honor? I mean, listen, he said himself, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus made it clear he was coming again. Absolutely, he was coming again. The Son of Man will come with the angels of heaven. He will set upon the throne of his glory. Listen, Jesus made it clear he's coming. It's just hard for us to see it because we, we become, we get used to life. You know, we get up, we go to work, we come home, we cook supper, we watch television, read a book, play on the computer, go to bed, get up the next day, do it all over again. It's a routine life. Well, it's routine for them too. But for some reason, this church in Thessalonica thought it was going to happen any time. And you know what? It seems like the mentality, even with the disciples, if you remember when the disciples were on their way to the uh, mountain where Jesus would actually ascend into heaven, they asked him, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, they still were looking for this physical kingdom I mean, what did James and John do the night that Jesus was betrayed? What was, their, what was their goal that night? To sit on his right hand and on his left. They even brought mom. You ask him, mom, maybe he'll let you, maybe he'll listen to you. You know, we're embarrassed. I'd be embarrassed to bring mom. But anyway, <laughs> the fact is they were still thinking a physical kingdom was going to come. Even up to the point that he ascends into heaven. But it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a kingdom of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus would make that clear. He would actually say those words to Pilate. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I would not be delivered unto you. Therefore, my kingdom is not of this world. But the kingdom was established on the day of Pentecost, the church. And that kingdom will be fully and completely realized and appreciated by those who are citizens of that kingdom at the second coming. Then that kingdom is going to be more real than anything you can possibly imagine. But the Christians at Thessalonica, they thought, man, it's going to happen any time now. So 
with that introduction in mind, let's, uh, let's take a look. And let's go ahead and read the whole first chapter. It's only ten verses. We'll start with Sam, work our way around the room. If you don't want to read, just don't, and, and we'll go on to the next person. short chapter, but boy, he sure says a lot. Right off the bat, again, he identifies himself, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, to the church of the Thessalonians. And like I said before, I used, to, I used to get hung up if someone said, my church, or our church. And um, at least until I stumbled on this verse where it says the church of the Thessalonians. See, I'm, I'm of the mindset the church belongs to God. So it's called the church of God, the church of Christ, the church of the firstborn. If anything should be capitalized, it's the of. But we, by virtue of inheritance and by virtue of adoption, it's our church too in that we are part of that family. So I was straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. And since then, I've said, you know what, uh, I'm happy to say my church, your church, and, and there's no problem with that. But, um, all right, let's, you stay on. Anyway, let's go ahead. We give thanks to God always for you making mention of you in our prayers. Paul prayed for the church. And, and that's why I say we, we need to remember that. That's why I brought it up tonight, because, you know, this verse reminds me that we've got to pray for the church. Pray for the church as a whole, not just here at Margate, but the church universal, that the truth, because, listen, there's so many different denominational teachings out there, some that may not be harmful, but most that are, especially the doctrine of salvation by faith only or the sinner's prayer or all that other stuff or once you're saved, you're always saved. Those doctrines are not in Scripture. And, and basically, Peter makes the statement over in, I believe it's his uh, uh, first epistle, where he says, and they shall bring in damnable heresies. And so we've we got to be careful. There are some doctrines, listen, if you think we're going to look like you know butterflies in the resurrection, I, I think you're wrong, but I don't think that's going to hinder your... Uh, hinder your resurrection and your salvation. But there are some things we don't change, and that's the plan of salvation, what it takes to be saved, what it takes to stay saved. The worship of the church, I believe, is absolutely important, how we are to come before the creator of all the universe and worship him. But Paul was thankful for this church, and he prayed for this church. And we need to be praying not just for the church here at Margate. We need to be praying for the church here. That we'll have boldness to speak where we can speak and, and, and wisdom to know when to speak and how to speak and what to say. And courage to invite others to come and to hear the word of God and to come and be a part of, of finding out what this is all about. And, and have wisdom to know what to say to people when we have the opportunity. Because God will give us the opportunity, but we need to be praying for the church. Paul prayed for this church and he knew they had some things wrong. He got the report from Timothy. He knows about the pros, but he also knows about the, the cons. Now, he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, 
and labor of love and patience and hope of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Think of that. Those, those some key phrases there. Remembering without ceasing what? Your work of faith. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people out there get hung up on faith and works. You know, they're like, well, you know, you can't work. You're not supposed to do anything. Listen, if you're not doing anything, if you're not doing anything in reference to the kingdom, where's your faith? What does your faith do then? Because James says faith without works is dead. He says it's, it's not real faith. You see, we need to understand something. I work because I really believe. I embrace Christianity and live a life that's disciplined where I tell myself, no, you can't do that, and you can't do that, and you can't do that, and you can't go there. I do that because I believe. But that also, all those things that that generates within me, that's not to earn anything. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking, okay, look at what I've done, God. You owe me, you know. I know better. All I really, all God really owes me is wrath and anger because I'm really a rebel in the sight of heaven. But the fact is, I've come to Christ. I'm no longer a rebel. I'm no longer alienated from the, uh, from the family of God. On the contrary, I've been adopted into the family of God. And so... We need to understand that this work that Paul speaks of, it's just an outcropping of faith. It's just your faith saying, hey, my faith's real. It does something. It does something. I've said this before, and I'll say it again because I think it's good. Uh, repentance is faith turning. Confession is faith speaking. Baptism is faith obeying. And faithfulness is faith living. That's all that is. That's, that's what it is. I mean, I, I believe, so I'm going to repent because I know that Christ commanded me to repent. I need to repent. I can't continue in a lifestyle that's sinful and still believe because if I do, what am I like? The devils. Yeah, the hypocrite. And James says, you believe there's one God? You do well. The devils believe and tremble. It's not a mental assent to a proposition of the fact. Uh, the devils know God believe uh, God exists. They know God exists, but they don't obey Him. So it's not a faith that can in any way save them. Our faith is not just a, a, a faith that we believe God exists. It's also what well, it comes from the Greek word pistuo, which means trust joined with obedience. What did we do in the garden? When we sinned against God, if we were to go back to the garden and look at it, what does that boil down to? Disobedience. But what, what did the devil try to do? What, what, was, his, what was his motive there? I, I know his ultimate motive is to overthrow God uh, and to become like God. I will put my throne above the throne of the stars of God and be like the Most High. But what did he do when he says, you, you shall not surely die? He's casting doubt. He's, he's sowing a seed of doubt in Eve's mind. That God's not been completely truthful with you. He's, he's holding out on you. you. You'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. God's holding out on you. you. So what is that? We doubted God. And faith, coming from the Greek word, is not just a, a belief that he exists. Adam and Eve knew that God existed. They opened their eyes, and there he was. Now, I don't know about Eve. I'm guessing she opened her eyes, and I don't know. He brought her to, brought her to man, so, yeah, I would say she, she saw him too, you know. How that worked, I don't know exactly, but they knew God existed. It wasn't about the existence of God. It was about trusting God. It's about trusting him and being obedient to him, even if we don't understand completely why. What's wrong with eating a fruit? Nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's nothing morally wrong with eating a fruit. With the exception of God said, don't do it. That's what made that wrong. But it made it wrong really because it was choice. God allowing man and woman to choose. And, and the same thing's true here. But don't, don't miss the fact that this, this work of faith 
It's because they believe in God and they trust in God. And he says, do something and they can do it. And Paul says, I, I, I remember that without ceasing. But then he says, labor of love. And I think that's important, your labor of love. Because if you love, you're going to do, you're going to do something. If you love your family, you're going to go out and do what you got to do for your family to help them not have to live under a bridge somewhere and to have the food that they need and to have the clothing that they need. Why? Because you love them. So you're going to labor, you're going to do whatever it is you've got to do in order to take care of those that you love. Well, this labor of love that they have is a labor of love that they have for God. That may also be a labor of love that they have for others, the lost, reaching out to them because he says your faith is being spoken of throughout the whole region. But then he says in your patience of hope. I think that's interesting because it looks like to me they're not real patient. They're wanting Jesus to go ahead and come on now. Let's go. You know, we're, we're ready to go. We got, our tickets, uh, we got our tickets punched. We're ready to go. Back in 1800 and something, someone predicted the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> I'm having one of those senior moments. I forget who it is, but I, I think I know, but I don't want to say for sure until I do. But anyway, he predicted the second coming of Jesus. He named the day and the hour and every time Jesus is going to come on this day. And so everybody in that church went out and bought white robes and took the day off. Some of them were sitting on top of houses, I guess, to help God out. You know, he didn't have to take them up quite as far. And the day came, and the day went, and God didn't come. So that man went back to his study, and then he came back, and he said, I made a mistake. It's not this year, it's next year. The next year rolled around. Same thing happened. Everybody got their white robes out. Some of them climbed up on top of the roofs, waited for him to come, and he didn't come. And rather than that man admit that he was wrong and even trying to predict the day and the hour that Jesus would come, that man said he came secretively to set up his kingdom in secret. And you can probably figure out who this is if you do a little bit of background. But I know one thing, yeah, <laughs> I heard it back there in the back. Jehovah Witnesses. But back, uh, I know one thing, back in Revelation, that doesn't work. Because Paul, or John, rather, in the Revelation says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. He will not come secretively and set up a kingdom secretively. The kingdom's already been set up on the day of Pentecost. It's the church, and when he comes back, he'll receive that kingdom. And actually, the book of Daniel says he will ascend into heaven, and he will deliver that kingdom up to God, and then he himself will be subject to God. So, yeah, Raul. That's right. No one knows when he comes. Actually, when Christ was on earth, he himself didn't know because of the limitations of being in the flesh and being incarnate. He didn't know. He said, not the angels of heaven nor the Son. I believe he knows now because at that time he laid aside the attributes of deity or the, the attributes of deity. I shouldn't say it like that. He laid aside the, the assets of deity uh, because he himself became limited he was not omnipresent. He was in one place, the second person of the Godhead. Uh, he hungered. He was dependent. So he was no longer self-existent or transcendent like God the Father is uh, and like deity is. Uh, and he was not omniscient when he made the statement, uh, the angels of heaven don't know, no man knows, not even the Son. That indicates he was not omniscient at that time. When he became a man, he set aside those assets of deity. He did not cease to be deity. He was still the God-man, but he did not utilize those things. And actually, Philippians, the second chapter, when it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be held onto or grasped as a victor might grasp to a crown, but rather emptied himself and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, that's the kenosis hymn. We had it in Philippians, the first chapter when we were, excuse me, the second chapter when we were actually going through the prison epistles. And that was the first one we went through. And that was the emptying. I mean, he laid, he laid aside those assets of deity, but he himself did not cease to be deity. Like I said, you can blindfold me and I can no longer see, but I do not cease to be a man. 
I lose that asset, that ability to see. Or you can uh, give me a cold and I can't smell anymore or, or not feed me and I can't taste anymore. But I do not cease to be a man because those assets that men have have been taken away from me. So, yeah, we need to understand that. We need to understand that uh, no one knows the day or hour. And these guys, they 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 weren't trying to peg the day and hour, but they definitely were pegging the general time. You know, they were like, okay, it's going to be soon. It's going to be soon. And some of them were saying, I don't think I'll go to work today. I think I'll just hang out. Jesus might come today, you know, and Paul's going to deal with that. He's going to deal with that. But he talks about their, their work of faith, their labor of love, their patience of hope. And let me tell you something. If anyone in the world has got hope, it's Christians. Because when Christ comes again... There's going to be so many, the majority, who will have no hope. They will have no hope. Hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved, our, your election of God. Now, when he speaks of election here, uh, we talked about this a little bit when we were studying through Ephesians. That you were the elect according to God's foreknowledge, so forth, predestined, so forth. And keep in mind, God does not predestine you to go to heaven or predestine you to go to hell. God knows what your choices will be. You make your choices. You are free to choose. You are a free moral agent. You have the right to choose God or reject God. God knows in advance what you're doing. Let me tell you, uh, Avon Malone, I'll, I'll never forget, it was one of the first things he said in uh, class and he went through the prison epistles. He said, the elect are whosoever will, and the non-elect are whosoever won't. And God just happens to know which one you're going to be. You see, God knows the extent of your life. From the moment of your conception, actually he knew it long before you were conceived, before you were even considered, uh, before your mom and daddy, he, he knows everything. Omniscience knows everything. Christ died as a lamb before the foundation of the world. God knew exactly what man would need before man was even created. But the fact is, God knows all your life. He knows if you're going to be faithful unto death. And if you're faithful unto death, he'll give you a crown of life. Hence, you are elected. You are elected. And Paul proceeds from that basis. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. He's like, man, you, you've got to be the elect. And actually, uh, in one place, he actually deals with that a little bit more. And we'll get to it shortly. He says, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. And you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now, this sort of goes right with the next verse. We be you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word, of, word in much affliction and joy of the Holy Spirit. So Paul's making it sure, listen, you know that we didn't just come in there preaching. There was actually power engaged here. I mean, and the apostles had power. They had power. If you remember, Paul was able to heal the boy who fell out of the window. He, and, and there were lots of instances where the apostles had power to heal. And we need to understand that. And, and they had the ability to speak in other languages. You see that on the day of Pentecost. Now, I don't know if they retained that ability. You would think they probably would have. There's no indication in Scripture that they continue to speak in other languages. But they sure, they sure traveled the empire. Empire. Uh, actually talking and preaching the gospel. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if they maintain the ability to speak in other languages. But he's making sure that they understand. Listen, it didn't come to you in just words. It wasn't just about words. It came in power and also uh, in the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about much assurance. Uh, you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. In other words, I think he's pointing to the fact that, listen, we, we were of noble character. Uh, we didn't burden you. We didn't burden the church. We went out and worked another job to take care of our needs so that you wouldn't be burdened. And uh, I think he points to that, not just here, but in other places as well, that Paul wanted the church to understand something. It was okay. He actually is the one saying a, uh, a workman's worthy of his hire and, and you shall not muzzle the uh, mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. He was one of the biggest advocates for paying the preacher and even paying elders. Actually, the, well, I guess the Hebrew writer actually did that. I, I sometimes uh, think Paul wrote Hebrews, but then uh, there's other times I debate with myself about that. But he says a, an elder or an overseer uh, is worthy of double hire. Uh, so there were actually elders who were on the church payroll who full-time elder. That's what they did. 
And I've been in a church that actually had a full-time elder working alongside of me. So that's, that's a thing that doesn't happen so much today, but it happened in the first century. But he says that you were, uh, you know what manner of people we were. You know how we lived, the lifestyle we lived. And he says, and you became followers of us. Is it okay for us to follow men who follow Christ? Of course it is. There are examples. I... I constantly reference Avon Malone, Jimmy Allen, L.V. Pfeiffer, uh, Paul Pollard, Joe Jones, all those men that taught me at Harding because I, I was amazed by their spiritual lives. I mean, and I knew they weren't lying. I knew they weren't just up there. I mean, Jimmy Allen could have made a whole lot more money preaching than he did teaching, a whole lot more. But he loved teaching preachers. That's what he loved to do more than anything else. And... You know, when he would get up there and say the very first thing he does when he wakes up in the morning and rolls over on, the, on his knees before he does anything and thank God for the day that's coming and, and, and for another day of life. I mean, I believe he did that. I don't think he was just saying that. I believe he did that. So it's not wrong for us to follow people who are devoted and dedicated to the Lord. And Paul's devotion and dedication it becomes unbelievably apparent. I mean, you just look at the life he lived. I, uh, compared to everyone else, uh, Paul, in my opinion, stands head and shoulders. I mean, all of them died for their faith in Christ. But Paul, man, he just kept on going. He was beaten, shipwrecked, I mean, left for dead, stoned. I mean, this guy went through a living hell on earth for the sake of Christ. And he'd just get up and go on to the next city and keep on preaching and keep on teaching. So you see that kind of devotion and dedication, and you got to stop and think, man, yeah, I, I'd like to be just sort of like that. I mean, one thing's for certain. <laughs> I don't want to stand real close to Paul at Judgment Day, you know, and like, all right, he's way over there, because if I stand next to him, I'm going to look real bad compared to this guy. He was amazing in what he accomplished, and he's, he points to that. Look, you, you know what kind of lives we lived. You know what manner of men we were. Keep in mind, it wasn't just him. It was also others that were with him. And he says, you became followers of us uh, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So already they're experiencing some form of affliction. I'm not altogether sure what this is uh, because a great persecution has not really erupted yet uh, from Rome. But there were still... There were still politics back then. There were still uh, conflicts. If you were a, uh, an idol worshiper and all of a sudden your whole family is like, hey, we're going up to the going up to Temple of Diana. We're going to worship Diana today. You coming? Oh, don't do that no more. Well, there's a conflict now. And I had that. I had that when I became a Christian. I was a young man when I came to faith. And I had lots of friends that I ran around with and everything. And then all of a sudden my life changed. And I didn't run with them no more. And I didn't talk like them no more. And I didn't do the things they did anymore. And I wasn't worried about getting drunk. And I wasn't worried about getting high. And I wasn't worried about all those other things that they were out there doing. On the contrary, they, they'd kid me and make fun of me. And I know I was the butt of many a jokes. But they say, come on, Finch. My last name's Fincher, so they, they nicknamed me Finch. And they go on, Finch, go to Bobby's Bar with us. We'll sing Amazing Grace. And I'd say, yeah, y'all go right ahead. I'm not going. But they couldn't get me to go because I knew better. I knew it was something different. But there was an affliction there. There was a, uh, it was a conflict. And, and I know that I was, uh, in, in a very mild way, persecuted. Uh, when I became a Christian, and I even had family members that looked down on my conversion. And so that, that's just bound to happen. Now, uh, with much affliction, that uh, might have something to do with all that we had talked about as far as him being imprisoned and beat at Philippi, uh, when he had to escape, uh, Jason. Well, he may be referencing some of the stuff that we talked about here. They lodged in the house of Jason. The Jews eventually stirred up the riot. Uh, against Paul, Paul escaped, but the Jews uh, did manage to take Jason. Uh, so that might also be uh, one of the things. And I would imagine that big event would have left a sour taste in the mouth of all those who opposed the church at Thessalonica. But uh, he says, so that you were 
examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So he's actually saying, you followed us. You, you followed our examples. You became followers of us, but now you're examples. You're examples. I think that's the process. I really do. I think that's the process that's supposed to take place. That, you know, what you've learned and heard commit to faithful men who what? Shall be able to teach others. There's this, this passing of the baton and this spreading out of the church and the, and the knowledge of Christ. And, and it changes you. It changes people in mass. It always has. But it also changes them one at a time. One at a time. So he says, you were examples. You become examples to all who believe in Macedonia. And from you, verse 8 is very important. From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. What's he saying? Man, you're taking the gospel to the world taking the gospel to the world. And if you cross-reference this, keep in mind, this is actually being written before Colossians. And in Colossians chapter 1, Paul actually says there that the gospel has been preached to every creature which is under heaven. And that's being written in 63, 61 to 63 A.D. This is being written around 50-something, 54, 56, somewhere in there. Some people say as early as 53. So, you know, they're 10 years before Paul's imprisonment and writing the prison epistles, and he's saying the word is going out from you. The church of the first century was an evangelistic church, and we're kidding ourselves. We're kidding ourselves if we think that we can be a good church of the Lord and not be evangelistic. There are three aspects to the church. Evangelism, benevolence, and... Uh, what it, dog, I'm losing my mind here. Evangelism and edification, building up. Ed, building up and teaching the members, edification. Evangelism, reaching out. It's a three-legged stool. And if you take one of those things away, and benevolence, feeding the poor, clothing the, uh, those who need clothing, uh, taking care of the sick, doing everything we can to help others. But there's benevolence, edification, and edification includes teaching the members. Remember Jesus said, go into all the world, teach all nations, baptize them, and then what? Teach them again. So you teach, you baptize, and then you teach again. That's edification. That's instruction. And so it boils down to you take away one of those things. We can be a benevolent church, and we can teach and train the members of the church to use their gifts and their talents. But if we drop evangelism, then we're not, that stool doesn't stand up anymore. Evangelism is part of the work of the church. Benevolence, edification, and evangelism. So we need to remember that. He says the word went out. It sounded out from you. Uh, not only in Mexican and Archaea, but also in every place. In your faith in, to God. And, and what is that? It's an example of their faith. It's an example of their faith. And it's spread abroad. And then he goes on. He goes, for they themselves show of us what manner of uh, entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. So he's, he's pointing back to the fact that, listen, you guys have come a long way. Paul's sort of like that. I mean, when he writes churches, even when he wrote the church at Corinth, and Corinth, let me tell you, Corinth was a mess. They had all kinds of bad stuff going on at Corinth. But, you know, the first chapter, he's like, I thank God for you always, da-da-da. I mean, he's, he, he puts the good up here first because that's just his nature. Uh, the only place he really just goes at it right off the bat is in the book of Galatians, where he goes, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him who called you into another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then he warns them, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which you've received, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel than that which you've received, let him be a curse. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. But here he's, he's doing what he normally does and saying, look, we're, you're, you're doing good. The word's going out. You have a work of faith, a labor of love. 
I, I'm, I pray for you always and you become followers of us, followers of the Lord. And now people are following your example and the words going forth. So he's, he's patting them on the back before he pops them on the backside. And that's what he's going to do here because they've got a, they need a little bit of a spanking to get themselves back in line. Just like our daddies used to give us uh, a little direction and instruction in the backside every now and then. Paul is sort of going to do that with them. He says, but they show what mannering of entering in, how you received us. Uh, some versions, I think, actually say that shows how you received us and uh, how we entered in. And you turned from idols, from gods who are made of wood, who are made of stone, to serve the true and the living God. You know, I, I, I've always wondered, I, I didn't grow up in a society where we worshiped idols. You know, we didn't, we didn't go to a temple and we didn't bow down in front of a, a big idol or statue of an idol and everything else. But it hit me one day, oh, there's idols. There's still a lot of idols out there. They may not be made of wood and stone anymore, but they're still there. Materialism can be an idol. Passion can be an idol. Money can be an idol. Things that you worship, things that you bow before. So all of the, your, your idol doesn't have to be made of wood or stone. It may be made of uh, capacitors and circuits. You know, I mean, there's just all kinds of idols out there, and we've got to be careful that uh, we look at these guys and say, man, that's crazy. Why would they bow before a, a statue? Well, what's that show that comes on? It used to come on on Tuesday nights, and the results came in on Wednesday night. What was that show called? Because a lot of people stayed home on Wednesday night from church so they could see who won on Tuesday night. American Idol. How about that? Isn't that funny? American Idol. <laughs> yeah, we, we still have idols. They're just not necessarily made of uh, wood and they're not necessarily made of stone. But I know a lot of people, I used to go to open up the church and do what I do on Wednesday night and I'm verse by verse. Peak of the week's always going to be verse by word, verse, every now and then questions, but for the most part, verse by verse in one of the books of Scripture, and on my way to the church, and uh, I drove by a lot of members' houses, and I could see their big old huge screen TVs shining through the windows, especially in the summertime when they'd have them curtains open, and some of the windows were, it was cool enough they could have the air conditioner off, and I thought, well, uh, there goes the there goes the crowd watching the shows tonight, but they weren't at church. They weren't at church. They themselves show what manner of entering in we had among you. And then he goes on. He said, you turned from idols to serve the living and the true God. And what? To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, there's a lot here. Because first, Paul says to wait for his son. From heaven. This may be a long wait, guys. I mean, I think he's just planting a slight little seed there because he's going to get to that. You don't know when this is going to happen, and you guys have, have got the cart before the horse here. So he says to wait for his son from heaven, but that's exactly what we do as Christians. Let me tell you something. This world's not our home. I told you this. We're just camping out. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims in a foreign land. Uh, we're just waiting to get home, and, and we have to wait for the Lord to take us there. But the way from his son, for his son, from heaven, how's Jesus going to come again? Is he going to be incarnate and come through the uh, womb of a virgin? No. He's coming, and every eye shall see him. As the light, Jesus actually says, as the lightning shines from the east unto the west, even so the Son of Man uh, the coming of the Son of Man shall be. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Let me tell you, that's going to be a day. That's going to be a day. And I've always wondered something. I wondered if all those cameramen from CNN and all those other news stations out there, if they're going to turn those cameras to that second coming and go, all right, now we can see him and he's breaking through the cloud. You think they're going to do that? No, they're going to put those cameras down and run and hide in the dens and the rocks and the caves of the earth and say, fall on us and hide us from the one who sits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they might say, this isn't real. It's not really happening. <laughs> uh, they'll get over that one real quick, real quick. But it's interesting 
whom he raised from the dead, Paul, sinner. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, the gospel of Christ. He said, I delivered unto you how Jesus was born, how he died, he was buried, and he raised from the dead. Even Jesus who delivers us, now watch the end of this verse, he delivers us from what? The wrath to come. A lot of people don't like to think of that. They don't like to think of God's wrath. But God's wrath is a judicial wrath. God is the creator of the universe. Is there anyone higher than God? Is there anyone God can defer to? Is there anyone God can pass that buck to? Is there anyone God can say, you judge the world, I'd rather not do it? No. God's the creator of all things. And His justice and His righteousness, according to the book of Psalms, are foundational stones of His throne. God doesn't just set aside justice. What do you think the cross is all about? I know the cross is about love, but it's also about justice. Christ satisfied the justice of God when he went to the cross. I've said this before, and I'll continue to say it. Repetition's first law of learning. The hell and the cross are built on the same foundation, God's justice. And to those who do not know Christ, to those who do not follow him, do not accept him, reject him and it doesn't matter what format you reject him you may just say well I just don't want to go or you may say I'm opposed to it I don't believe in God but to those who oppose him or to those who reject him or those who dismiss him you'll still meet him face to face that's inevitable he will come again and when he comes when they hide in the dens and the rocks and the caves of the earth what do they say fall on us Hide us from what? The Lamb. For the day of His wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? We don't get it. But sin, consistent, persistent, unrepented of sin. From now to the day you die or now to the day Jesus comes again will alienate you from God's love, His mercy, His grace. It will be withdrawn, and all that's left is His anger. And it's not a teenage anger. It's not a temper tantrum. It's a judicial anger that serves what is right and what is wrong. You want to know how I know hell is right? Because God made it. And there are people there. And God can do nothing wrong. How many of y'all have known truly wicked people, truly wicked, that take pleasure in inflicting pain, take pleasure in doing evil? Multiply that by a million. Did that person deserve to go to hell? Does that person deserve to go to heaven? There's a wrath here. There's a wrath here. It's a judicial wrath, but it's still all the same. It is wrath. And he says he saves us. Who's saved from the wrath to come? His people. And so if there's no other reason to come to Jesus, there's a lot more reasons to come to Jesus. Just the love that God shown to us by sending him to the cross. But if there's no other reason, you should come to escape the wrath that's going to come. And that's a biblical motivation. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus himself said, Fear them not, which destroy the body, and are not able to destroy the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. That's Matthew 10 and verse 28. So we need to understand there's a fear of God that this country, this world is pretty much dismissing. Why? They don't believe there's going to be a day they're going to meet him. But there is going to be a day. And this book the first and second Thessalonians is going to point that out. It's going to prove it. Jesus is coming again. And I know we're 2,000 years down the road. And to us, it sort of seems like, I don't know how. I, just, I can't imagine what it's going to be like, guys. I, I can't imagine what it's going to be like. But there is a clear picture painted within Scripture that there's going to be the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive and remain will be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. Marvel not at this. All that are in the grave shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Man, the Bible points to this last day over and over again. Jesus' favorite term for this day was the last day. And in the book of Revelation, after that day, it says, and time shall be no more. You see, we, we live in a, in a bubble of time created by God. 
But when that's done, when this earth passes away, everything's done, judgment's finished, those who are lost are sent away, those who are saved are taken in, a new heaven and a new earth that we will, I'm convinced, watch God create and wherein dwells righteousness, never stained by sin. I can't imagine what that universe is going to be like. A perfect, flawless existence forever and ever. Listen, we're going to see it. With whatever eyes we have, resurrected eyes, how that's going to be, I can't imagine. But it is going to be. And just because I can't imagine it all, just because I can't picture it all. And isn't it funny how Hollywood doesn't do anything with that? Man, talk about special effects. They could really do a lot with it. They ought to hire me to come out there and let's put something together that actually shows all this stuff with all those computer-generated graphics. And let's, let's paint it the way God paints it. But see, we don't want to paint it that way. Because of the majority of the people that are here when he comes, Jesus made the statement, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? What's his point? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is implied by the question. Real biblical faith is going to be rare. It's going to be small. So comparatively speaking, how many believers are there in the world? Seven and a half billion people. How many believers? If you count all the denominations in the Catholic Church, 1.8? Well, I'm not sure some of them you can't count <laughs> because their doctrines are so far away. I, I don't subscribe to some pretty serious, the, the biggest number in there, I don't subscribe to it all. So if you take that out of the picture, you're talking about less than one. You're talking about less than one by far. So anyway, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Real Bible faith is going to be scarce. Thessalonians are mistaken, though. They think he's going to come in their lifetime, and he's not. Now, guess what? They're home. They're there. They wait in spirit bodies for the resurrection of the dead, and now they're there if they were faithful and elect, according to the gospel that Paul preached. All right, we're two minutes over. I was going to try to end early, and look at me. I always do that. Uh, any questions? Yes, Jane. That might have been, I was thinking it was uh, Russell, Russell, yeah, with uh, Jehovah Witnesses. But that, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Oh, there's a guy in California right now that has a radio show, and he claims to be Jesus himself. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. And, and he's got, he's on the air all the time. So, yeah, he claims to actually be Jesus himself and I believe talks about his own coming. It's looked like, well, I think you've already come if you're here, you know. At least that's what it looks like to me. Right, right. I believe so. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Liberia is it's going crazy in Liberia. He just posted another video of baptizing five or six people. So Alfred's definitely got Crossway Mission support, and I'm happy to support that guy. And I'm going to get over there one of these days and uh, uh, go visit with him. But, yeah, there it's taken off. Here? For the first time ever in the last, uh, I believe I was telling someone here about it, but we're down to 48% or 46% of this nation, only 46%. For the first time since this nation started, it is less than 50% say that they believe in some kind of deity. So that's pretty much means that over half of the country doesn't really believe anything. You know, It's like I said before, self-made self, self men Worship their creator, you know. But if I'm not mistaken, our movement consists of about 2.7 million people. Just Christians, only Christians, yeah. So, yeah, we're we're small in number, very small in number, comparatively speaking.
But I know one thing. I've looked at all of them, and we got the plan of salvation right, and we got the major doctrines right. I believe we have the worship of the church right, and uh, the organization of the church right. I think we are as close to the first. If I knew, I'll be honest with you, if I knew anyone closer to the first century church than this movement, I love you guys, and I love this movement, but I'd go there because I want to be as close as I can possibly be to the church I read about in the Bible because guess what? There wasn't all the different denominations. They were just Christians, only Christians, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. They were just Christians. They were called Christians first at Antioch. That actually wasn't a flattery, a term of flattery. It was actually a, a detrimental term. Their leader was actually a criminal who was crucified and executed. So it wasn't a, a term of flattery, but God took it as such and decided that's fine with him. Christians just fine. But uh, no, uh, not a lot of us sin. Not a lot. Two, 2.1 maybe. I'll, I'll check that number too. I got one number back to you. I'll try to get that one back to you. Right. Uh, that comes from the book of Revelation. It's basically, you got to keep in mind, the, the book of Revelation is unbelievably apocalyptic language. It was written that way intentionally by John. Now, some people have speculated why was the book of Revelation written in apocalyptic language. Well, God often uses apocalyptic language. Uh, Peter actually would stand up on the day of Pentecost and say, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, the coming of the kingdom, the actually overturning of powers, moving from the old covenant to the new covenant he says the moon will be dark or the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light well he wasn't being literal it's apocalyptic language talking about the shifting of powers and and heavenly bodies and and covenants a changing of covenants uh people have taken the book of revelation and they have come up with all kinds of things they've come up with a thousand year reign on earth they've come up with uh, 144,000. One religion teaches only 144,000 get to go to heaven the rest of us get to stay on a paradisal earth but only 144,000 get to go to heaven well those 140,000, 44,000 are all men, and they're all virgins, so Peter's down here with us because he had a wife. So, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's apocalyptic language, and so much can be. Here's the message of the book of Revelation. The kingdom of God will overwhelm and overcome the kingdoms of men, including Nero including Rome, but it was written in apocalyptic language at the height of the persecution against the church. And had that book fallen into the hands of Nero, Nero would have read it and said, I don't have a clue what this is talking about. He wouldn't have known what it was talking about. Had he read it and it said the kingdom of God will overwhelm the kingdom of Rome, the kingdom of Nero, then the persecution would have even gotten more intense. So why God chose to write it like that, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. That's one of the books that we may next summer do a seminar on. But it will be a five-week seminar, and we will cover big chunks and deal with it. I am a millennial. I believe that there's nothing left to be fulfilled. I believe Jesus could come at any time. I don't believe there has to be the temple built where the Dome of Rock stands right now. I don't believe there's going to be a literal antichrist who's going to make us get a mark on our forehead and mark on our hand. All of that's symbolic coming out of the book of Revelation. Antichrist is anyone who teaches against Christ. And John says that in the end of the first century, there are many antichrists already gone out into the world. Anyone who's against Christ or teaches contrary to Christ is an antichrist. So it's... It's nothing left to fulfill. Uh, some people say, well, I don't have to worry about the second coming of Jesus because the temple's not rebuilt in the, on the Temple Mount uh, because that has to happen. And then the real Antichrist, some guy who's going to, you know, some of our preachers believe this. I don't. I don't because it doesn't work with John 5. All who are in the grave shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The, the, the premillennial view that talks about the Antichrist and all of this and the 144,000 and the thousand year reign of the church, all of that, it doesn't work because they got two resurrections. The resurrection of the righteous and the rapture of the church and then a thousand years later, the resurrection of the unrighteous and the end of everything. And it just doesn't work with John the fifth chapter as well as other passages. So it's complicated. But at the same time, Paul makes it pretty simple. When it comes down to the Thessalonians, he makes it pretty simple. Jesus is coming again, but you don't know when. 
So get your jobs, do good, live your lives the way you're supposed to live them, and whenever he comes, whether it be by second coming or whether it be by death, and you leave this world, you'll be ready. You'll be ready. So any more questions? All right. If you got any, just write them, send them in, email, call in. You can do whatever you want. We'll try to answer them. Uh, stay in this book, uh, First and Thessalonians. They're short books. Read them. Read them slowly, intently. And uh, underline the stuff. If you've got questions, put a question mark next to it. Bring it up in class, and we'll talk about it. If I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll find the answer. I'll find the answer. Okay, let's have a closing prayer. Brother Ron, would you close us in prayer? Thanks for being here. Those of you who joined us on Facebook,